the group was initially two uh, groups of songwriters, one, one of which was more influenced by the heavier kind of Rolling Stones R&B stuff. And Mike and I were in the school group doing uh, covers of Animals, Kinks, all the heavier stuff. Peter Gabriel and T Tony Banks kept, was, was, I mean, we're all into the Beatles, but he was, he was a more of a Beatles than a Rolling Stones man. And Peter was more into Tamla than Mike and I were. So Tony was also more classically trained of verse. So they brought, there was a more sort of, um, a, both a more classical edge and perhaps less hard. We were, we, we initially were the kind of rougher edge, certainly. But then Mike and I discovered 12 string. And then so that we then had a kind of lyrical arm. But early on, the others were the more cultured, if you like. What was it, uh, um, 12 string is interesting to me, what was it about 12 string that appealed to you? Because um, I mean, it, was, a, it was different from the, you know, the average mm. boy with a guitar. Well, sort of arrived there by accident really, um, played a bit of acoustic, then played electric. Um, but um, like a lot of things, like most things at that age, you copy. Um, there were a number of well-known electric 12-string tracks, obviously Beatles songs, um, The Birds, um, but the amount of songs I can remember on an acoustic 12-string, where that was the seminal instrument, or almost almost none at that time. It tended to be a sort of a strummed instrument, with, and if you had too much plectrum sound, it was a bit like a washboard. I can only thank a chap called Tony Henson, God knows where, where he is now and whether he's even alive, but it literally was, um, I think, it was it the hippie summer of 67 or was it the one before? But he was playing a 12 string in a field at Charterhouse and it was just like a road to Damascus for me. I just thought that is the most beautiful sound. I just love the rich quality that you get with the octaves. And um, so I think whilst I'm very derivative in lots of respects, I think that was, we went down quite an original path because we weren't actually copying anybody. I'm sure melodically we were, and there were some groups who we were influenced by who were doing things with two guitars, like Fairport Convention with Richard Thompson, Simon Nichol, but it wasn't two 12 strings. And Mike and I would literally sit, you know, we'd have this, it was a sort of just a kind of sonic feast. We'd kind of say, you play E minor, I'll play D, and we'd do it at the same time. And of course, with all the octaves on the 12 strings, it created this fantastic kind of shimmering sort of thing, very different to, I think, what a lot of other people were doing. So um, that was fun, yeah, it was great sound, loved it. It sounds like you were excited by the pure musicality of it, rather than um, you know, ooh, let's let's try and write something that is you could define as say pop music. Yeah, I think that we didn't sort of sit down and say, oh yeah, we can use this to write a hit song. We weren't. We were still at school, so there was you know we we'd been signed uh, well, around the same time we were signed by Jonathan King, but I don't think there was a sort of you know, having to do it for a living. It was all just a lot of fun. So there was no thought of, yeah, yeah, we can use this to write a hit song. It was just exploration. And if something catchy or commercial came out of it, so much the better. You were signed by Jonathan King, King of Hits, uh, as he calls himself now. Uh, probably did then. Um, presumably at that point, it was like he was the guy you knew about because he'd been to Charterhouse. What was the story? Well, the story is, is, is four extremely feeble and, and frightened people and one brave friend of ours called John Alexander. And we'd done these demos um, and it was OC's day, old Carthusian day. Jonathan King was spotted there and we had the demo tape, but we were too frightened to go and give it to him. So John Al, as he was known, he was he was never phased by anybody. So he just went up and just gave it to him. and and. and King, as we called him, liked one. He liked the song that was done by accident because the demo session was Mike and I saying, Tony, will you come and help us with the keyboards? And he said, yep, I'll do it if my mate Peter Gerber can come along and sing one song. And that was the one that John Lee King liked, didn't like either of them. Because Mike and I were writing some pretty rough stuff. That is, sorry, that is pre-12 string. That was pre-12 string stuff. We were in between sort of, you know, bad Rolling Stones and I don't know where we were, but... Um, they had this lovely song and we were signed really on the basis of that i think on that song and maybe other potential that he saw and been the others what was that song it was called um she is beautiful 
which became oh dear help it became a different song it changed titles i think um it wasn't the silent sun it wasn't the silent sun it was before it was before the silent sun silent sun came later after we after we'd been drilled in the art of trying to write short pop songs by jonathan king which i resisted i didn't like the silent sun at all so on the strength of one song that he that he liked that and it was great it's a lovely song yeah but that song was never actually recorded. Oh, very much so. Yes, it was on from Genesis Revelation. Oh, it was. Uh, but I, but I, I can't. It was, it was called "She Is Beautiful" to start with. I'm not sure what it ended up as. It was a lovely song. Yeah. Um, and they had some lovely songs in their locker, which is why the first album was dominated by their stuff. As Mike and I were sort of finding our writing feet. Um, Silent Sun was the single. Did that come out before the album? Silent very much so yeah i mean we started off um doing demos for jonathan and we were signed in the middle of 67 that's right all the dads had to come to the meeting because we were too young and then see we were at school for another year and a half so during that time we we, we started writing songs and we started because it was around the time when the beatles were you know you had to think about what was going on at the time you know we'd moved through all the early beatles you know we weren't i want to hold your hand anymore we were day in the life so we were writing these epics you know with loads of different sections and of course jonathan king was completely what are you guys doing you know i want you to have a hit um which is fair enough so Peter and Tony started sort of trying to write more short form stuff. So Silent Sun was the, see, I thought it was dead bland because I, I liked all the more Ponzi stuff because that's where we'd arrived, if you think, in, in, you know, in musical language. Um, but, uh, and it wasn't a hit. And thank God it wasn't. I don't say that through sour grapes because I just think that we didn't have a style. We didn't really have a, a proper style. You know, and and Jonathan King was trying to, in a way, make us in slightly in his own image. We'd had Hedgehog as anonymous, and you know, I thought everyone's gone to the moon was a lovely song. Well, well done him. He was prided himself the only knew seven chords, and he used them well. But if we had been successful, the group would never have developed its its proper style and voice. It would have been a disaster. Um, and we did another single called Winter's Tale that wasn't successful. And then Jonathan King very kindly sort of said, "Well, okay." You know, you've towed the line with me. Um, do your own thing up to a point. And he was very decent because, you know, just just let us loose on an album. Um, we didn't start doing loads of five or six million epics, but we were back in territory, definitely not verse, chorus, you know, uh, bang on, nailed on chart stuff. There were a couple of things that were possible. I think there were, I can't remember what was released as a single, but it certainly wasn't successful. So he was very decent. Um, in that respect so it went two singles weren't successful and then the album which sold about 600 i think i think we knew everyone that bought it just about and we haunted the corridors at the bbc that summer of 69 desperately trying to you know um interest people and nobody was interested and at that point the group nearly broke up and there was this it was right on the cusp of do we have a go at changing into a live band going on the road and it was really it was really toss up almost didn't well I'll come to that in a sec um just going back to the recording of that is it right that it was all done in in one day one recording session in one day no 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 no, no. it was um um just welch got that wrong I well i think he's probably thinking of a rather rather more and more celebrated group um the Beatles, the Beatles. Um, no, it was. I mean, it, we, we had to get on with it. We had to get on with it. I can't remember how many days, but it would have been a number of days. Um, we probably did about. I don't know. I'm guessing actually. Should have kept a diary, really. Three or four songs a day. Then would have been vocals. Probably maybe a week. Ten, I'm guessing a week, ten days, that kind of thing. Um, do you remember? The, do you recall the sort of uh, atmosphere of, of putting this together? Was it? Was it? Was it exciting? Or? Loved it. Absolutely yeah. loved it. That summer we went from one friend's parents sort of house, some of them country houses, one, one was rather quite big and it was, we just did a week's rehearsal at each place, then ended up by doing demos at Brown Roberts's place in, in Chiswick and um, then did the album. I mean, it was a schoolboy dream if you liked, if you liked music. I hardly remember an argument. Everyone seemed to agree and um, it was just, was a really kind of heady time. Um, um, Were you looking back now? 
I mean, how how sort of green were you? Very. So, very uh, well. I don't think I was green in the sense of thinking it was going to. Be, we'd we'd come down to earth with the two singles not being successful, so we weren't sort of thinking, oh yeah, the album is going to be. I, I think what we probably thought was that uh, the single drawn to singles are drawn to blank because they didn't, in my opinion, have a lot of individual character that was different to other groups. Um, they could have been almost anybody. Um, I think what we probably hoped with the album that the album did have the beginnings of our own style. And that therefore people would latch onto it, but they, we sort of missed really on that, which is disappointing. Um, can, can, I I just, yeah, so can I just check? Is that window short or is it open a bit? Oh, are we getting a bit of. Yeah. Oh, are you hearing my voice? Okay. Yeah. yeah Question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. First of all, why. Genesis, the title. Of Jonathan the, King's idea. Any, what, can you recall what, it, what was his reasoning behind it? How did this come about? I can't, to be honest. He certainly wasn't a devout Christian. Um, it's been used as a brand name for many things since, and obviously, you know, given the, given the genus of the word, you know, the beginning of things, and, and therefore implying um, fundamental creativity, not a bad title, but it was, as I'm sure you know, there was an American Genesis. So for for a while, we were going to change our name to Revelation, um, but then I think they disappeared, so we ended up by carrying, keeping going with the name. But hence the title of the record. Absolutely. From Genesis to Revelation. Well, I mean, it also was was this in any way a concept? that contained all the songs, I mean, the Genesis, Revelation, sort of theme. Uh, and for instance, The Serpent. Well, not really. I mean, there was a sort of loose, loose concept, to, to a very loose concept uh, to, to the album, which was a sort of, you know, development through time. Because if you think you've got in the beginning, uh, the, the, the oceans and motion and all that kind of stuff is talking about the turbulent early, you know, uh, prehistoric times. Um, but it was pretty loose. I mean, not all the songs fall into that category at all. It's like one day is just a, you know, a love song and Am I Very Wrong and stuff like that. So um, um, it, there's a sort of quasi journey going on with the end track place to call my own. But um, I think some of Pete's lyrics were develop it, were sort of developed the concept, you know, sort of early man who's confused, like in the wilderness and stuff like that, uh, in hiding. Um, but it was um, it was not a tight concept. Right, and Pete was 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 the driving force lyrically. Wrote most of them, yeah. Wrote most of them, certainly. Certainly, at that point, he did, yeah. Um, a lot of the time, we didn't have any idea what he was singing about, actually, because he was quite—he knew some quite. He was not a, a particularly talkative person, and, or wouldn't regale you with long words. But I remember there was a song we had called, which never was recorded, called "Masochistic Man," and there was a line, "Carve the Eglin time with bitter juices of your body." And none of us knew what the hell an Eglin is. It's a rose, I think. But so he was—he was often quite, quite kind of. Um, Erudite in a way, very descriptive, symbolic, yeah. But sort of intriguing and mysterious. Absolutely, and of course he, he took that you know, to a greater height later. Um, just to go back on that first single, which um, we now know the title of, uh, do you want to just uh, recall that again? So? Well, it was the, yeah, the first, the first song, um, that was um, caught Jonathan King's eye was was on the first group of demos was called originally was called She Is Beautiful which I've been rem reminded by my colleagues it became the serpent on the first album yeah and a very good song it was too but it failed to uh, <clears throat> it certainly didn't make it as a single did it turn up as a no, I mean, I think it had a lot of potential. I don't think it was, it, was a, it was a classy song, but it wasn't a surefire single. I think the first one they released from, was it Where Sour Turns to Sweet? In fact, in fact, Sour Turns to Sweet was released before the, before um, Silent Sun. I just remembered that, um, uh, or at least it was done, sorry, it was done as a single 
but then in the hippie summer of 67 it wasn't released that's right but no i don't think she is beautiful the seven i don't think any of the songs on from genesis to, to revelation were, were were surefire singles no moving on so you have this jonathan king period where essentially i guess the band is <clears throat> driven by the the pop ethic in a way you're, you're yeah. trying to produce short songs yeah. that, you know, that will make it into the charts the, the the lack of interest in that i mean was that good in the sense that you could then be free to expand your ideas and develop as musicians well, I think with the benefit of hindsight, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? At the time, it was deeply depressing. Obviously, when the singles weren't successful, we were disappointed. But uh, as I was saying earlier, I think it's probably a good idea that we weren't successful because we probably would have just trotted out facsimile stuff and wouldn't have developed. Um, you know, there was a lot of kind of birth pains in, in the, in the, in the um, process by which the group arrived at its, its more identifiable, cogent style a couple of years later. Um, and um, it, it certainly was a difficult period. We were very disappointed when From Genesis to Revelation didn't achieve any success. In fact, we were so we were so depressed about it. We, uh, you know, it really was. I was just saying earlier, it was touch and go whether the group would actually go on. You know, go on to what? Because we weren't a live group. We were a group of songwriters. That was we. That's what we were signed as, and really effectively we did pretty much record the album still a bit like that in, in a way um and john silver the drummer was going to go to america to cornell university so we were back to the four of us with no drummer um mike didn't play much bass um so there was no it was you know, university was coming up and um it was it really was touch and go and then so we decided to go on the road um and everything sort of things weren't all planned out you know it all sort of really happened by accident um but one of the things i was mentioning that was difficult was I mean, tony was a piano player you know anybody and he plays keyboards would tell you that the difference between playing something that's you know got a loud and soft piano forte and playing a you know organ or a is completely different you know you just don't have the control over the key and he found the uh, you know but it's also the amplification problem he found it very very difficult in fact you know he really hated the organ to start with and was used to call it a box of tricks and stuff and um it was a question of finding another drummer and so the whole thing was pretty fraught um and we were we were we were some pretty disillusioned boys during that summer we had one or two people one or two who disappeared off into the ether who were very encouraging and kept saying you know you've got something you should do this go on with it and i'm you know be very grateful to those guys because it really was touch and go you know we just mooched around getting very depressed but um um any memories of um the typical gig at that point well by this no well we haven't quite got to where we gigged yet we haven't quite got there you were kind of starting to to go out there and play in a few odd places. Anyway. Well, the yeah. summer of 69, we mooched around country houses and eventually decided to give it a go. We played at a, a, a summer of 21st and we were pretty awful, to be honest. Um, and it was after that that uh, Richard McPhail's parents lent us the country cottage for the winter. And we did a couple of weeks at my parents' place first and knocked a few um, sort of tracks designed as live music tracks which is what we'd never really done before we we just written songs you know to, to perhaps try and be a hit or not but we were now writing things that were much harder edged things which were quite dramatic the knife for instance was written during that period i mean not a whole lot of it but it's very different to what what was on the previous on the previous albums and so um so we arrived it was a pretty quick change although tony found the organ tricky to start with i mean he adapted to it amazingly well and mike um almost overnight became a very good bass player worked very very hard at it um so i suppose I, well i mean i can't remember exactly when the first gig was but it would be something like october maybe late september perhaps yeah, probably october 69 and um, and we were, obviously we were really rough around the gills because we didn't actually put us in front of a live audience. We didn't really know what to do. But but some of the material was already on the way. Um, 
and we kind of refined it and just got a bit better. We started off by doing quite a lot of quiet songs as well. Um, uh, there was a sort of um, intermediate uh, set of material which was sort of owed something to from Genesis to Revelation, but was sort of more, if you like, sort of, if you like, sort of putting Crutus progressive from, from Genesis to Revelation, which rather died on the road, which is sad because because you know we were playing gigs where we weren't playing concerts you know we did play brighton dome and a few others where people would listen but we had a bizarre set of gigs uh because we had a lot of different agents and we had agents that would put us in you know watford tech on a friday night with the lads who just want to you know hang out and they don't want to listen to a lot of quiet poncy music why should they done and um, then we'd be playing a, a really bizarre nightclubs in london with italian arms dealers and gangsters shades and of course the last thing they wanted to do they just wanted to smooch so the whole thing was a complete misnomer a lot of it but occasionally we'd pitch up at these these just perfect pubs or big club uh, big pubs or clubs like friars farks one or two of the others and then the audience did listen and we started building up a bit of a head of steam at those sort of places and but overall there weren't enough of those to for the some of the quieter songs to so we gradually started shunting off some of these quieter songs and um ended up with um you know a louder more dynamic set and the thing about the knife is uh it's got a harder edge i mean the knife yeah obviously but uh, the sound, um, and it's got this, this uh, I think Steve Hackett would talk about how you, you have a, a, a kind of clash between um, the quiet and, you know, something which uh, can, can uh, jump out at you mm. and, and surprise you, and, you know, shake you into a sort of a, <clears throat> an awareness of, wow, you know. We're not all just in a stupor here, sort of yeah, yeah. drifting through this. Um, quite a, you know, a bit of excitement in it, a bit dynamic. Struck me that that's possibly the beginning of a move into where you can you could maybe link it up to um, Watcher in the Sky, mm. Supper's Ready, Absolutely. Music Box, you know, mm. those kinds of Genesis numbers, which we we equate with a sort of classic Genesis period. Um, which which you had a hand in at that point, and also um, I think was the music box being written at the time that you were still with the band as well. Well, Mike and I got together on a few of the original bits that ended up in that. Um, I mean, he developed it with the group long after I'd gone, but um, we, we he he kicked it off. It was a tuning called F sharp tuning, and we did it, we did some of the initial bits on that, couple of the initial bits on that. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the looking back on it, the um, the knife and looking for someone, I think they and stagnation. They threw down a, a sort of it was, it was like a template, I suppose, for what was to come, which is often the uh, you know you kick off you kick off with a song, which is often quite quiet, and then it goes through an enormous amount of changes, often quite dramatic, often quite um, um, aggressive. Um, and then quite often would would come back. Uh, I mean, it's quite a traditional form, isn't it? You've got the old A B A, but this, but 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 the B would be extended through a lot of different sections um, before you get back to the in classical terms, the sort of recapitulation. Um, I mean, the knife was actually called the knife because um, this is going to disappoint people because the original song by Pete and Tony sounded like the nice, so it was just known as the knife. And then actually, Pete's lyrics are not about revolution they're a spoof at revolutionaries which again is kind of <laughs> kind of probably probably disappoints people because peter was not a revolutionary um we were just you know middle class boys but um but it was very quick you're, you're right i mean i don't really quite know how it happened i mean there was the influence still from the beatles and there was influence from clearly on that one from from the nice so and mike and i were being very influenced by uh, there was influence from Procol Harum, the influence from Family Fair, Fair Book Convention. So some of those groups were influencing the original song, but then we were going off. And I think probably the influence when we were going off onto the instrumental sections, everybody would probably have to admit was King Crimson, because they'd thrown the gauntlet down within the core of the Crimson King for incredibly dramatic and very tight playing. 
hugely powerful and dramatic and so we were mesmerized by that not so much by the very fast jazzy stuff because that wasn't really liked it but it wasn't really our bag so you've got some mixture of the early songwriting influences and then and then the crimson with their enormous um, live prowess so all this was going into the mix around the time we set off um you know, it's difficult to say, isn't it, with the melting pot, exactly what, what con elements. But that, that's, those were the elements that I think constitute you know, a lot to, um, to the fact that there's somebody at the front door. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Getting a handle on Genesis, uh, the, the, the origins of the, of the, uh, the ideas, you know, the sense of, well, OK, let's take, take, take this band in. 68, 69, mm. young guys, and there's all that stuff, as you say, that's mm. going on from, from pop and very exciting kind of ex extended stuff. Um, but you, initially, there's a sort of um, it, more acoustic, folky, but trying to push the envelope a bit on that. That's my take on it. But then this influence of, you know, let's perform and let's try and excite an audience and let's try and expand and change from the, the, set, the small stuff is kind of pushing you, you know, I'm sure you're playing King, King Crimson and thinking, and the nice and thinking, oh, come on. Let's. Well, I think it's important. I think those groups did definitely, they definitely gave us the... Um, idea about trying things that were were much more dynamic and much heavier and things that were well I mean I mean the stuff that's going on in the middle of the knife and looking for someone is a million miles away from what was on the previous album there's nothing like it um, but it don't, I think luckily it's not too derivative you know don't think people have listened to the knife and looking for someone said oh yeah mate that's like yes or that's like we were able to be I think I hope I'm not being sanctimonious but I think we were able to be influenced by by the ideas, but not actually sound, you know, like a sound alike, sort of copying note for note. There's going to be elements, it's always elements of people where you, you pick up a little riff or a motif or something. But I like to think that between us, we, we kept, it was quite a sort of natural development, organic. Did, um, was there a, a Trespass? I, I, I love Trespass, actually. Mm. I, I just feel that it's kind of, a group of musicians who've kind of hit their stride in a way. Mm. But you're pushing the envelope, you're, you're trying new things. Um, it's, it's, it's got a freshness about it. And the, the, the opening track, Looking for Someone, Peter's voice is so kind of pure and like punches out, doesn't it? So to me, it's a very successful, kind of in a way, first album. Well, I know it was the second. No, I think you've got to look at, I think it's fair enough to look at it like that, actually, yeah. Are you, are you proud of that album? I think, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it was the first, as you say, of of a, a succession of albums which which took a particular course and took a particular style and developed. So obviously being part of that first one, yeah, I'm very proud. I mean, looking for someone interesting, again, you see, going back to the point about where the song kicked it off, it was very much early on a kind of Stevie Winwood type song. Pete was quite influenced by Stevie Winwood. We all love Stevie Winwood. And so you've got, again, you've got that initial slight influence, just as you have the nice. But then the thing is hurtling off into a completely different direction. Um, and your point about the quiet song, which then suddenly, um, this, we were actually, I hadn't really thought about it quite that, we were, I suppose, really establishing a kind of template for a lot of their later material, which was not directly copying anybody. Was uh, Peter's, Peter's voice is obviously crucial in the sense um, hmm. You know, there's, a, there's this, the, the genesis sound is beginning to, to develop in a way, the, the, the undertow, you might say, which, it, which is yourself and, and Mike and, and, and Tony. And then Peter's voice coming, coming on the top, adding this. Um, I mean, to, to, at that point, it seemed to me that you were a very crucial element in this, you yourself, as a part of the mix, very crucial. Did you see it like that, or were you already kind of thinking, mm, I don't know where we're, where we're heading and whether I'm part of it? Um, I 
I don't think I, I think we were all just sort of in it together really I don't think any of us sort of sat around and thought well, I'm really important or I'm really not important or I don't belong here I think I think for John Mayhew I think it was difficult because John was an outsider and uh, he um, had a slight chip on his shoulder about various things he was a dear fellow I think it was difficult for him I don't think the rest of us um, sort of felt one way or the other really I mean the problems that I experienced later were to do with with just you know with with, with stage fright I mean it was nothing to do with the feeling I didn't belong or or, or did belong um, I think we just we just were all going along on this voyage it's a little bit difficult for Peter sometimes because when because he didn't have a an instrumental bass if you like um, he was often slightly marginalized in the writing I mean looking for somebody who already had the the verse so that was fine that was all safe but when we go off developing the sections he didn't really have a, a, a power base you see because Tony would be on the organ Mike would be on bass I'd be on electric guitar or two 12 strings Pete might pick up the flute but he'd often be slightly marginalized during that development process because he actually wasn't playing anything and didn't have any way of and he'd come up with ideas which were often very good but we often tended to slightly ignore him looking back at it which was probably wrong because Peter always had brilliant ideas but because it was just difficult for him to demonstrate because he didn't have an instrument um, I mean it, it goes without saying it was, the vocals and the lyrics were crucial um, but what Peter would often, when the rest of us were developing the stuff, he'd go off and make the phone calls to the agents. I mean, he was very practical. He was the one that did all the dog, all the legwork. So he might appear to be somebody with his head in the clouds, you know, his lyrics, but he's nothing if not practical. He was the most practical one of us in that respect. So he, he in a sense, was pushing the band's future. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing the potential had the... He was. I think the rest of us were a bit more naive uh, in terms of um, you know, the music will out. He knew the music wouldn't out. He had to be bloody well get on the phone and get get gigs and hassle away at it. And uh, um, but uh, as I was saying, I mean, he, he was given the space to do that because the fact the rest of us were developing. And I think sometimes he would come back into the song and maybe feel a little bit left out. Um, um, and perhaps had to go along with sections which he maybe wasn't necessarily completely sure about. Um, and he always had ideas that were sort of ahead of their time, really, on arrangement, which the rest of us didn't really listen to often. And uh, looking back at it, I think he probably was right, actually. So it's interesting what you're saying, because it sounds as though he might have experienced some frustration quite early on. I think he did. I think he did, actually. And he wasn't a pushy guy at all. Um, and he couldn't de he couldn't really demonstrate it. That's the problem because there wasn't somebody to demonstrate it on. Uh, mm. If you were to um, kind of briefly encapsulate the different qualities of, of the of the band at that point, I mean, what would you say? I and mean, what would you say about say Tony at, uh, at first? Well, in terms of the mix of the group. Um, I mean, Tony was immensely talented, um, very, very creative, um, very strong personality. Um, Mike, again, a tremendous talent, which sort of emerged during that phase, was more, Mike would be more um, kind of relaxed and diplomatic. When it got to sort of bartering, it was a difficult business. If you've got four composers with no set template it's not just verse chorus which verse is better which chorus is better somebody would say well let's go off down that route and somebody would say well i think we should go off down that route and it's uncharted territory who's to say which is right or wrong um and it you know they, it could get difficult at times because there's no right or wrong um so there would inevitably be certain you know there would be disagreements there had to be i mean just four people writing together is not a natural process um uh, and Mike was very diplomatic. Pete could be very stubborn, but he would just back off. But Tony, was, Tony had a very strong will, and he was very good. So um, he and I were probably the two that sort of, you know, kind of <laughs> went most of the way there, if you like. Um, but I would tend to back off as well. Um, he was the better musician as well. So, um, but it worked, you know, it worked, and. Um, I think where we were foolish was 
naive was living in the same place together for a long period of time. You know, anybody will tell you that if you live and work together all the time, it's, 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 of course it's going to lead to frustration. And um, we, you know, the guys never saw their girlfriends half the time. It was positively draconian. Um, and, you know, it was all the sort of, it was in the, it was in the, in the, wake of all the let's get it together in the country cottage stuff you know all the hippie kind of stuff and you know we knew that the traffic had done that and uh and uh, but we were too serious we never went for walks we weren't the sort of group to go down the pub and have pints and you know relax and kind of maybe at the end of the day where there'd been a few arguments just kind of you know rub rub put a bomb on the on the thing and it all got a bit tense i think it wasn't really helped also by the fact that we were eventually just doing exactly the same set every night so there was no new music to kind of give you a bit of um excitement a feeling of going forward it was it got very treadmill like um same stuff traveling in the back of the bread van no windows and people started arguing and it's kind of inevitable looking back at it we were too young to know the difference but but anyway you know we 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 got there we kept going until the end of that um phase uh, it's like a school year really i suppose and we're looking back at it you know started in september and in june we got picked up by by charisma so we made it we did all these um i used to find them really hairy we did all these showcase gigs and ronnie's upstairs at ronnie scott's which was great fun because we used to have, have to carry the organ up about a thousand steps and back. We had no, we had no road. I mean, we had mates working as roadies, but we, there was no do that. You know, we were all in it together. So there was no question of hanging around afterwards and having supper with people as well. People have often asked about this, you know, because we played with Nick Drake quite a lot. And, you know, how do you, do, you know, do you go to the pub and Nick? Do you have supper? No, 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 no. We finished the gig. Stuff had to go back into the van. Off we went back home again. Um, so, you know, it was, it was pretty serious stuff. It was probably too serious actually looking back at it. And I remember finding it all starting to get terribly tense. And I used to get me very frightened towards the end because I remember thinking, oh, this is too serious, too serious, too serious. And all these agents were coming and watching our showcase gigs in London. It was like, God, if we screw up, you know, oh God. I, f I definitely got very freaked by it towards the end. It was too intense. And you also were, were, were getting ill, probably, possibly caused by it a lot of attention and stress when you were getting ill, right? Yeah, the thing, the thing that's tricky for me looking back on it is I'd had glandular fever badly, uh, sorry, quite badly, not compared to being hospitalised. It was the worst I've ever, I mean, I've had things like that sound worse, like bronchial pneumonia, but glandular fever was the worst I've ever had. It was real pink elephant stuff, you know, and you, you know, being delirious and you couldn't, get anything down your throat apart from some dreadful stuff called Complan, I think it was. And I'd then gone straight into the group, pretty much. Sorry, A-levels, and then straight into the group. And of course, I found it years later that you're supposed to, you're supposed to be careful for about a year afterwards. You're supposed, or maybe two years, you're supposed to eat well, sleep well. Well, we did, I mean, Rich tried his best with all the looking after us with the food, but I mean, it was pretty basic fare. And, um, you know, we were travelling up and down the country in the back of a bread band, dossing on floors. I mean, we literally, we pitched up somewhere in the Midlands and we had nowhere to stay, too far to go back. And some guy said, well, I know a guy with a bloody big ass in Buxton. And we stayed on the drafted floor of a bloody big ass in Buxton. So I don't know to what degree it was, you know, the physical stuff or whether it was tension or the two just... But I eventually just sort of went kablonk, really, and... Um, I've heard since that glandular fever can affect your nervous system, which I didn't know about. So, you know, maybe no coincidence. But, yeah, I mean, it did get, um, it did get quite tense. Um, Fun enough, I heard um, Derek Jacobi recently. You're thinking, what's he talking about? I heard Derek Jacobi describe exactly the same thing that happened to me on one night on stage. He was describing just about to go on stage to do to be not to be which everyone knows well and he just apparently he had this thing where he just suddenly thought i don't know the, i don't know i don't know the words i can't remember how's it go and he found himself on stage saying it but not knowing how he was saying it sweating profusely and exactly the same thing happened to me i was at watford tech i remember playing the opening thing of let us know it love and i looked at the guitar and i thought i haven't got a clue not a clue what comes next and then I saw myself playing this thing, but it was really scary. It was really scary. And the trouble was that 
but um, it wasn't the sort of thing you thought you could talk about. Years later, I've learned this is kind of de rigueur amongst actors. Loads of them have been through it. But at the time, it was just a very scary experience. Um, so, yeah, so I had a lot of that and it wasn't great, to be honest. It's sort of like having a panic attack. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. But your mind just goes blank. But if you go on to autopilot, which is what he was saying, and he said he fought through it, you know, and uh, I tried fighting through it, but I didn't make it. At what point do you, do you remember, uh, at what point you, you just said, look, I'm well, well, what happened was, maybe, no, I never, I didn't actually, no, I never, I never lost it, um, but I got bronchopneumonia as a result. I sort of just went, you know, and of course I was off for a couple of weeks and doctors were saying, this isn't good for you, you should leave, clearly this doesn't suit you, and all the rest of it. And I didn't, you know, and I just found my heart really wasn't in it after that, really, is the truth of it. So, um, but we'd done the album, which is the important thing. So, I mean, I signed off at a, at a you know, I did my bit. I did hold them up for a while, which is which is which is regrettable. But you know, and then obviously leaving when I when I held them up wasn't great. But I thought it was the right thing to do. If I hadn't left, they may never have got Phil Collins. So <laughs> Tony um, is saying that um, the point that he felt that you were almost the, the leader of the band, mm. certainly the a very important member and musically and that he felt at the point that you left or you said you were going to leave that that was probably it because you were so important to him well, it's kind of him to say it i think i think history has proved otherwise but it was kind of him to say it i think the mike had sort of subsumed a lot of 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 you know i mean he I wouldn't say, you know, it's simply my style, but, uh, you know, our, st our mutual style had sort of, he'd adopted a lot of that, and I think he was able to carry on, uh, carry on a lot of that with Steve. Um, I mean, I was by no means an exceptional electric guitarist at all. Uh, I wasn't particularly original. I was reasonable. So uh, somebody else was always going to be um, able to do that. I think there were, you know, there just were, there were just enough very, very clever people in that group, to be honest, to carry on, in retrospect, quite quite ably and I'm but I'm obviously very very nice of Tony to say that so at the time you didn't feel um, you weren't particularly aware obviously I mean you're going through this thing it must be a, a quite agonizing thing I'm gonna have to, to just leave it you, <coughs> I'm sure you weren't thinking particularly of how it was affecting them or whether they would carry on I mean I, I imagine you thought it would just carry on without you yeah, I, I think, I, I certainly didn't flatter myself by thinking, oh my God, I'm so important, they're going to pack up. I thought quite the reverse, to be honest. Um, I, you know, everyone seemed to be so, so strong, uh, really good at what they were doing, and very professional by that stage. Um, no, it never, never occurred to me they wouldn't carry on. Um, yeah. When in fact you were right. Absolutely. Um, the uh, interesting sort of period of the, the album coming out, Trespass, and then the, the serious stuff starting. Um, what, just uh, if you could tell us your experience of signing up with Charisma and Tony Stratton Smith and how that came about. Um, well, I can't remember who contacted Strat as he was known as, but, you know, he, he was one of the big wigs that was coming and seeing us uh, at these upstairs showcase gigs. And um, he was um, very nice. He was that old style sort of patrician record company manager. You know, he did horse racing and all that kind of stuff. And he was a very gentle man. And... Uh, you know, I mean, it's a real shame there aren't more people like him nowadays because um, the truth of it is that, you know, he backed that group during many years of not making much money. And, um, you know, nowadays this is just endemic shortism, short-termism, I mean, which means that groups are either forced into trying to be too commercial too early or just shown the door if the accountants look at the figures on the page and uh, this band hasn't. So... I I just think the groups don't get a, don't get a, a, enough of a chance to have the to be matured if the people really believe in them and to develop. 
or they're forced into something too early that's wrong. It's probably no coincidence. A lot of bands that are still very famous are old bands because they had more time, there was more patience. Um, and he he typified that era. He was a terribly nice chap, very gentlemanly. Um, and it was a nice it was a nice stable charisma. But unfortunately, you know, I look back on it with sort of mixed feelings, really, because you know I could see one part of it was nice, but one part of me was, you know, heading out the door. So it was difficult, really. But no, a nice man, hugely important to the group. I don't think they would have made it without him. Did you? Um, uh, you know, the, I think there's a, the, a story about the sort of gig when they, which I think Tony Stratton Smith and Gail attended, Ronnie Scott's, there was probably three or four people in the audience. Uh, but that was the gig that decided them to take you guys on. Do you have any memories of that particular gig? No, I don't remember any specific ones. I just remember they were all scary because there were always important people there and there were, there were very few people there. And that was the only thing. There wasn't a great atmosphere, you see. And so you just knew that the people out there were, you know, very important and very critical. <laughs> and, they, you know, there was no big throng of an audience to respond to, which so it was, um, they were particularly scary. It wasn't, um, no, I don't remember that specific one. No, they all just meld into a memory, actually. Was it a, a, a big relief once you decided you, you weren't going to go on? That, that did the did it drop away and you started to feel okay? I'm not sure life is like that, is it really? Um, I mean, it was more a kind of, this is, I've got no choice. You know, I just, I'm burnt out really. I don't really like having to do this, but I don't think I've got any choice. I didn't go out and celebrate. I didn't feel good about it. I just felt, and it felt a great feeling of relief. It was a kind of numbness, to be honest. I think it was probably quite depressed is the truth of it, because, you know, I was probably the one who was the most keen on going on the road uh, initially. I mean, I'd been the one, I was the, you know, I was the driver in the original school group. You know, I was the one always being the dictatorial, tyrannical one, saying we must practice, we must practice. You know, when I arrived at Charterhouse, um, we'd had a group called League of Gentlemen who was sort of a jazz band, but, you know, I got straight in there with my mate Rivers and Rob Tyrrell, and then we got Mike Rutherford, and we had this group called Anon. You know, we were the kind of, um, you know, and I was, I was absolutely, you know, I was, I was completely obsessed by the whole thing. So... Um, I, you know, I was, like a lot of people, wanted to be, you know, I was a huge Beatles fan, you stand so the idea of being in that sort of thing myself was an absolute dream that's lasted from 13 up till 18. So the, I was, I was completely disillusioned. I was, um, relief, no, I, it was just a numbness. I don't know where I am now, but I know I've got no choice. I'm no good to these guys now. Um, and now I was lost soul, definitely, yeah. Moving on and with perspective, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and with the wisdom of hindsight, as we've said in, about other aspects of this story, hmm. um, you must have watched them from a distance and then maybe uh, realised maybe that, yeah, they, it's, it's fine. <laughs> the decision you took was fine. Is that right? Or you, do you still regret that you took that decision? It's a funny, the, 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 the question about do you regret leaving Genesis is one I've been asked so many times and, and of course the honest answer is that I didn't have any choice. I wasn't, I, you know, it was no good for them and it was no good for me. So I don't think regrets are really in it. If I'd walked out in a state of high dudgeon through musical differences in a, partic in a, in a totally healthy state, then of course I'm, I'm an effing idiot. But, um, and I should have regrets, but simply regrets are neither here nor there. It was the only course of action that was available. Um, so um, waste of time, really. Um, and anyway, as I said, they got Phil Collins, so it all worked out pretty well. No, I mean, there's no point in thinking like that. I do remember playing in a game of cricket, actually, once, and going out to bat with this nice chap, but he's rather on my thing. So we're back going out to open the batting, he tells me, tell me, Ant, did you regret it? And I was thinking, what's he talking about? How does he know I haven't got a box on? And of course, he's talking about leaving Genesis. So I get asked this question at the most bizarre places and the most bizarre times. I can't remember what I said to him, but I think I just... <laughs> In, in, uh, 
just just with your your sort of knowledge and the history of the band, what, what did you make of Genesis's progress? I mean, the the arc of their career through through um, Lamb and then Peter leaving. Did did it surprise you that Peter left? No, I don't think so. I mean, I followed them a lot after that early on. Um, and um, I suppose I did feel a bit guilty because they didn't get another guitarist to start when the poor old Tony was playing some of my part. Suddenly did his technique a lot of good, but it must have driven him crazy. And um, I got to know Phil quite well, who was just, you know, so friendly and so... And, um, you know, he worked so well with Mike. It was just brilliant. Um, but these were the same kind of gigs, you know. Once it started to get very, you know, these huge, daunting, big places, then I began to feel it was something I really couldn't cope with. I didn't particularly like that kind of thing anyway. So I probably, from about maybe 73, 74, by the lamb, I probably didn't watch them much then. Um, I didn't know about the, um, you know, I've, I've learned, I've heard since film and both Steve said about all the terrible arguments that used to go on. I didn't know about that. I sort of saw Mike a fair amount, but he obviously wouldn't tell me about that. I just think it's inevitable in a group where you've got everyone composing like that, there's going to be disagreements. Everybody wants their slice of the cake. And more to the point, these, these, these chaps are all developing now their own innate style, and they have a vision. And clearly Peter must have felt more and more, I think, that, that, that his vision was being compromised. And, you know, one fifth of the cake was a fragmentation of what he saw. Um, I don't know to what extent it was a, any particular personality clashes. I just think it's inevitable that you can't have that many writers in the... I mean, it's no coincidence it ended up with three. I mean, that's tough. But, you know, four or five is just it's heavily, heavily weights it. Um, so... Um, Probably a little bit surprised at the time, but but quite quickly not surprised, I think. Um, Peter's, um, so it's almost, uh, you know, we talked about this sort of figurehead, uh, apparently to the public maybe seen as the leader mm. um, through that period with his theatricality and mm. his presentation. Um, so to many people in the public, um, especially the music journalists. Of course. You know, Peter's leaving seemed like, okay, that's it, Genesis is over, folks. Mm. Um, but then. Extraordinary. I know, quite extraordinary. Um, I mean, everyone knew that Phil could sing. Um, I mean, ironically, he sang a couple of songs on my first solo album before he became their lead singer. By the time it came out, it was a couple of a year or two later. I got I got stick for cashing in on the Genesis lead singer, which just goes to show how wrong the press can be. Much as I love them, um, but um, I'm sure you know the story. They auditioned. It wasn't it wasn't a, a, a you know a sort of a shoe in, and I don't think he necessarily wanted to do both. But they couldn't find anybody else that they felt. Um, you see, he'd also he could incorporate a lot of Gabrielisms as well, you see. So he could sing the early stuff, and that was the thing. He used to sing well with, with, with Peter, so that was vital. So both from the point of view of, of, taking, of carrying the old legacy on and also the talent that he had for the new stuff, nobody else could come close, really. Um, again, with the benefit of hindsight, it looks very sensible, but it must have been seemed pretty daunting at the time get another drummer, what's the other drummer going to be like, and all that kind of stuff. Is that really practical? Not many groups were doing that. Um, a guy that had been the drummer suddenly coming out and fronting it. I mean, I'm trying to think if any have done it. They've been singing drummers, but not ones that, I don't know, are there any others? I'm not sure. But um, So, yeah, no, they did incredibly well, um, incredibly well. Um, and Phil was obviously such a phenomenal find in every way. I think as a person, I think he was incredibly important to the group because he was that kind of Jack the Lad, good vibes, um, positive, happy-go-lucky. I know there are aspects later in his life, but it's not like that, but that was basically him. And um, John Mayhew, much as I, I loved him and respected him, was much more uptight and, and sort of nervous. And actually, I think if the drummer's like that, 
it can affect the rest of the group. I think Phil's personality, as much as his musicality, made an enormous difference because also his looseness and lightness must have helped break down some of the kind of slightly more middle class, you know, tension and all the rest of it. Um, so it was, you know, he was a sort of a, a triple genius fine from all those three points of view, if you like. Were you still um, a sort of Genesis fan in the 80s? I mean? um, I think as they got more more um, mainstream commercial, I I probably didn't think it was as original as before. I mean, I for me the high watermark would be selling in above the pound. I think um, I like a lot of the later stuff, but when once it started getting very um, much more mainstream pop, I just thought they were nice pop songs, but. It wasn't. It wasn't sort of seminal anymore to me. Um, but also remember, I'd studied in the meantime. I'd, ch I, you know, this is this is very subjective because I'd studied classical music, and I'd kind of gone through a whole road to Damascus thing with that, and then was moving into TV and film music, which was becoming a lot of my favourite stuff. So a lot of rock and pop music was not meaning a huge amount to me by the mid '80s, really. You know, I was you know, grown up, I suppose, in the respect, and I. They were appealing to a, a, a kind of more poppy audience, and um, it was good stuff. But it was never going to mean the same to me as the as the earlier stuff had done. Um, you know, I, I don't have any regrets about leaving because it was inevitable given what was going on. But if you if you then said to me, "Would I like to have been part of some of the music that they did later on?" Absolutely. I mean, who wouldn't? You know, selling them by the pound and stuff like that. I would love to have been involved in stuff like that. And um, I, of course, I'm always going to wonder what what would have happened if I'd, you know, uh, if I'd carried on, and what influence could could I have had, and the stuff I'd been part of. But then, um, you know, the Lord giveth with one hand and taketh away with the other. I, th I was a very narrow musician at the time, and um, I I studied and learnt um, and acquired many more skills and stuff after that. So whilst I, I still would love to have been part of their music if i'd stayed i would probably have remained in some respects i think quite a narrow musician whatever i achieved so you know you win some you lose some really and it seems to me that um being on the road at that that first period of being on the road did not appeal to you at all as a lifestyle as a, as a, uh, and that probably these huge tours of these massive stadium shows would actually just not have been you either. I mean, I, I don't know, really. This is this bizarre thing, you see, because I was the showman. Pete acquired a showmanship by acting, because as you probably know, he was phenomenally nervous to start with on not stage fright as such, you know, the crippling stuff, but just natural, very ner very nervous. So the point he would never remember the lyrics. I mean, it was hopeless. People were, you know, he couldn't do the announcements. Richard was going to have to get a makeup. And I don't know if you know this story, but the big joke is that because we spent so long tuning the 12 strings, which were always going out of tune in these cold clubs, somebody had to do something. So Pete started telling stories. So he started acting. He got outside himself. Once he got outside himself, um, he was fine. It was not him, it was an act, and like a lot of actors are very shy people. Um, so that, you see, that worked, that worked very, very well for him. Um, hmm. I can't remember the point, so what, what's well, the point? It's interesting because you, you just said that, uh, that you were the showman. So that's right. Yeah, well, I mean, I was, I was, you know, I loved the early school group stuff. You know, I loved, you know, Richard, Richard McPhail was Mick Jagger and I was Keith Richard. I used to love prancing about it. I wasn't, I, you know, I used to like all that. I wasn't, I didn't feel shy about being on stage at all. No, I got hit by, I got hit by a sledgehammer that crept up on me later. But um, no, I liked all that. I'd have liked all the adulation. And the group is no, I'm joking. But because we never had any of that, it was far too early for any of that, and we were far too sort of cerebral a group as well. I um, mean, we got taken around to mop the Hoople's place, and they were so sweet with us. But we were like, you know, we were kids. We didn't know what was going on. There were women in every room, and they were probably their wives. Okay, I don't know anyone who caused any caused any aspersions, but they're really sweet. To us. Our eyes are popping out of our heads, you know. Well, I was there at the wrong time. Uh, Damn it. Oh dear. <laughs> 
no, uh, no sex, drugs, and rock and roll. No, none of it. No. <laughs>